Pleasure. And at this time, I would like to turn today's program over to Tony Croft, Senior Service and Support Specialist with Profile Technical Support Team. Mr. Croft, the floor is yours. Hello, everybody. Thank you for joining. I'm uh, just going to go through a few basic things with the auditor and how it can help you avoid problems as you're doing a tax return. So basically, there's three ways to activate your auditor. The first way, you can just click on Audit, Show Auditor, and that will bring up, as I have numerous things here that we'll discuss, shows all the different warnings that you have in your, uh, your auditor there. And to get out of it, you just click on Show Auditor, then go Show Auditor again, and it's gone. Another quick way to do it is just to press the F9 key on your keyboard, and that will bring up the auditor right away as well and start circling different errors, warnings that you have. The other way to do it is the little icon, Show or Hide Auditor, over to the right by the check marks. You can click on that. And that as well brings up the auditor. So three easy ways to uh, bring up the auditor and check the return that you're in the process of working on. Now what I'd like to go through the important thing of setting up your different uh, options in the auditor. So if you click on the Options tab and go to Environment, and then once you're in the Environment, you'll see over to the right the Audit tab. So if you click on the Audit tab, this brings up all the, uh, the different variations that you can select. Normally, we have it defaulted when you install Profile or do an update to where you have the Passive Auditor checked off, Display Review Marks, Circle Fields, which means a field that is in question will be circled, and then Show Auditor Tabs. Show Auditor Tabs is basically just down at the bottom here, you'll see your summary, your warnings, your notices, sign-offs. That's where you've chosen to sign off on that aspect of the return that you know is correct and uh, you just wish to sign off on it. Issues will bring up any issues, which means that you've gone along and done something like go in here, go to Review Marks, and select correction required, which puts an X on the uh, on the field itself. So in some situations, one person will be doing the tax return and another person will be uh, reviewing the return so that they can go in, the person reviewing the return can select you know, correction required so that the person goes back that was originally doing the return goes back and takes a look and what needs to be done. Uh, you can also do something like Come in here, go to review marks again, and put a question mark there. So now you'll see in our auditor at the bottom we have correction required, or I've got a question mark, you know, which could be, is this correct? So going back to the options environment audit tab again. So we discussed those, the main fields at the top. So then you can decide what you want to have selected in the summary tab. You can have warnings, and warnings, preparer sign off, partner sign off. If you have like a partner that reviews the returns with you, uh, no sign off, correction marks, question marks, overrides, memos. Most of these are automatically set as defaults when you uh, download the program or you do an update. But people have different preferences. You can come in here and select things like memos, e-file errors, send errors, carry forwards. It's, a lot of this is personal preference. EEI errors means uh, e-file errors as a rule. AT1 net file errors, that's for Alberta corporate returns when you're uh, internet filing an Alberta T2 return. CO17 internet filing is the same. That's for Quebec uh, corporate returns. Then over to the right, we have the audit summary, which includes your, your warnings, your notices, prepare, sign off. Once again, many of the same things are in here. Now, to prevent filing, we have warnings, correction marks, question marks, overrides and e-file errors. Normally we have it defaulted to warnings, correction marks, 
and question marks. Send errors, that's normally if you're at a discount or discounting returns. And this will set things up. So you see I have correction marks selected as prevent filing. So I'm just going to show you an example of when you try to e-file a return, what can happen here. Just one moment. So I'm just going to show an example of what happens when you try to e-file a return. So if you click e-file, e-file this return, right away I've got all different kinds of warnings here, which is prevent filing. So I'm just going to continue on and just click OK. Now I get the message that it's failed, the tax returns failed. Here's a handy little trick to determine what exactly is going on. I know we have obvious things here, but if you click on the plus sign, I'll see this return has prevent filing audit messages, the street address and postal code, street address and we have detected problems. So e-file number 99173 means that there are issues in the return that need to be corrected. So we'll just cancel out of here. And so because I've got question marks and X's as correction marks as prevent filing, if I really want to file the return, I need to go to review marks and go no marking, and then do the same over here. This is how I like to do it. I just like to do the right click and go right to review marks and do no marking. That eliminates those two warnings. Quite often we have calls where people get a little confused and don't realize they have some X's or question marks throughout the return, so it's something you have to determine where those are to, so that you're able to e-file the tax return. Another important thing that we come across is an options environment audit. So we have everything selected, but somehow we've unselected on prepare sign-off or on partner sign-off. So this means that when you take those these out, and I'll just show you how this works. Even though I've done a prepare sign off, and it will show in my auditor down at the bottom, but because I've got a check mark, even though it looks like, okay, I've realized, you know, I just wanted to put a check mark, the phone number is correct in this situation. But what happens, because in options environment, you have unselected these, so the program doesn't realize that you guess you have signed off but because somehow these selections have been unselected it will prevent you from e-filing. So in this situation I've done a 2125 statement of self-employment income and I've created different errors sometimes by mistake the numbers uh, an entry will be made in the partnership business number when it isn't a partnership and so you'll see that I have the warning here. So what I have to do is come in and realize that I made a mistake and put something there and take that out when it shouldn't be. And then I've also done something here this, on a rental form where I've just come in and have not completed the information. And so obviously we have a warning here. And so I just have to come in and select those entries. A common question we're getting now, too, is that uh, we have clients that uh, are doing tax returns for people that own rental property outside of Canada, as in the U.S., the U.K., or other countries. And we have a problem where people are trying to put in the, uh, the zip code, say, for uh, a U.S. address. What Revenue Canada wants now is instead of putting in a zip code, they want you to put in the uh, the taxpayer's home postal code. You can come over here and put in 
the address. And you can put in the country and the zip code here. But the e file the tax return, it has to have your taxpayer's home postal code. Otherwise, it's a e file rejection. Now you see that as we work through different things in the auditor, you'll see that uh, taxpayer has self employment income. Please enter the province of self employment. So this is always something that you have to come in and do. Make sure that you have province of self-employment entered. A few other things that we get are, let me just give you a second here, in the options environment, we'll have, people have send errors checked off. So sometimes you get to a result where you're doing a discounted return and you click and you do the uh, system for electronic notification of debt and you have send errors checked off. This can prevent e-filing as well. And you'll see that we have audit summary includes memos. This is another thing where you can come in. and do a memo on the tax return such as whatever you determine you want to do. And then this will show down in your auditor, when you have your auditor open, if you put in different memos through the tax return, you'll see that by clicking on the memos tab here, it'll show you if you go through a return and you're putting in numerous memos for your reference in the future, you'll see that you'll have a list of all the different memos that you've entered in here. One question we get quite often is when a tax return is e-filed, is the memo sent on the e-file? The memo is not sent on the e-file, so that does not go to Canada Revenue in any way. We are experiencing something right now where we have a situation where the taxpayer's income is zero. We need to we are correcting this, but it's not kicking in that the taxpayer's income is zero, so you can get an e-file rejection right now on taxpayer not having any income, but it's saying no, so we are correcting this problem. It will be corrected shortly. So we are, as I said, we are getting a few calls where people are trying to e-file their tax return, and uh, it's getting rejected because they're we don't have this being indicated as yes if their income is zero. Another thing we've just discovered too is that some people can come in by mistake and say yes to his return completed under the CRA's volunteer program. And then by doing that, they're not able to change the contact method. So I, we just came across this the other day, how that happens. And we don't have a warning on this. But you have to make sure that uh, if you're not able to change the pre and post assessment here, that you have no selected to lead under the CRA's volunteer program. Another common problem we're also seeing too is that when uh, people e file a tax return and it's getting rejected on the name, like the program doesn't know what, you know, if the name is wrong or not until you e file. So we are getting uh, rejections on uh, the last name. So in that situation, when you get rejected on the name, you need to come in and say yes to last name changed in 2013. Not really part of the audit, but just as we're going through the info page, I thought I'd bring up a few things there. We also sometimes get uh, warnings about invalid characters in the free format area. What can happen? is that on a 2125, when you have a sole proprietorship, by mistake, an entry will be entered in, in the partnership section here. And then it'll get rejected as well here. 
We also have warnings, too, that maybe some of you have come across where you'll get a warning that the uh, taxpayer is over 60 but no CPP. So that could be something where you go here and... Uh, You see where I've generated taxpayers over 60 but has no CPP income. Is this correct? So a good way when you have warnings like this is you just double left click on them and it takes you to the, the T4AP Canada pension slip. So in some situations people can be, you also get this warning if they're 60 or over. So we've put in the warning to generate if a person 60 years old or over just to uh, check to confirm that they haven't received Canada pension. And if they haven't received Canada Pension, you can just come in, do right-click, go to Review Marks, click on Prepare or Sign Off, and you'll see that that message from the auditor has disappeared. The other thing, too, is with uh, T4A Old Age Security, you'll get the same thing. if they're over 65. And what else can we talk about? So basically, I think I've gone through just the basic things, but I am willing to take any questions or uh, whatever questions you have. So. I'll open up the phone lines to any questions that you may have now. To ask a question live over the phone, please press star 1. You'll hear a tone acknowledging your request and a prompt to record your name. To withdraw your question, press star then number 2. And as a reminder, you may ask a question through your web console. Please locate the Q&A panel from the folding toolbar at the top of your screen. We'll pause for just a moment to compile the Q&A roster. And there are no questions on the phone line. Okay, while we're waiting, I'll show you a few things that can pop up on the T4 slip. When you enter in employment income, we calculate uh, what the uh, CPP should be. So in this situation, because my client is over 65, we're suggesting that there shouldn't be any CPP payments. So I'll go back to the info page here and we'll just change the date. Okay. Sometimes, too, when you've, you've entered something in a column, a good way to get rid of it is just do a right-click and delete column, and there it gets rid of the information. Oh, I still got my warning. Why do I have the warning here? See, this is where the, the officer gets you moving around looking for things. Oh, and I just realized why I'm getting that message to see in box 28, I just said yes to being CPP, QPP exempt. So once again, the auditor doesn't tell me everything. Sometimes I have to take a look and see. So what can happen when you have a, a T4 slip? In some situations, there might be more Canada pension taken off than what is calculated. So what you can do here is, once again, do the right-click review marks do prepare sign off, and that takes care of that issue. Sometimes you'll have the same with EI as well. Do the same thing, right click, review marks, prepare sign off. Also, in some situations, you'll get a T4 slip 
that has a different amount in box 24 or box 26 for EI insurable earnings or CPP pensionable earnings. So profile automatically when you enter in the amount in box 14 automatically takes it to 24 and 26 and puts in the same amount. There are some situations where on the actual T4 that you have in your hands, the amount can be different. And so if that's the case, then you do have to come in and override. And then once again, find override if it's uh, if you have the T4 and it's indicating a different amount. So then once you've overridden, you do the right click with your mouse again, go to review marks, do your prepare sign off. That takes care of that issue. We do have some situations where a person will have a T4 slip and say they have $30,000 of employment income, but on the actual T4 slip itself, it has zero in box 26. Now, profile's automatically going to put whatever was in box 14 into box 26. We have had situations where people, because they look at the T4 and see it's zero on the in box 26, that they override this to zero. Usually that is not the right thing to do because that's going to give your client a full CPP overpayment of what they've paid. We are coming across situations now with the, uh, the opting out of CPP, especially with people that opted out in 2012. After they turned 65, they wanted to opt out of paying CPP because of the new rules. And so, as I said, they've made the election in 2012, but in 2013, their employer is still taking Canada pension, deducting Canada pension when they've opted out and it really shouldn't be happening. So what we're suggesting in this situation is that the client has opted out, you have record that they've opted out in 2012, that you come here to box 28 and say yes to being exempt from CPP. And that way your client will get the CPP overpayment compensated back to them. Hopefully this won't be a common situation, but it has been happening in the last couple of weeks where we've got calls on what to do. And uh, that's what we're suggesting at this point in time. And I've walked a couple of clients through this situation and by, by saying yes to exempt from CPP, the tax return has been e-filed and everything apparently seems to be fine. Is there any questions from anybody? Or? And again, that's star one to ask a question over the phone line. And as a reminder, you may use the Q&A panel from the floating toolbar at the top of your screen. There was a question through the chat box. A young woman wanted to know, will this be sent out via email after the call? It's going to be uh, recorded and put on our website. Uh, we've done a couple on e-file, and uh, this will be on our website. Um, you'll have to check this on our website later. It'll probably be out tomorrow or the next day. And we do have a question from Daryl Pavison. Hi, Daryl. Hey, Tony. I was just wondering if you could spend a couple minutes just walking through how you do a T1 adjustment. That's something I haven't done before through the oh. – and if you and, and if you can e-file it. So. No, you can't e-file a T1 adjustment, but I'll, I'll show you. It's a pretty slick system that Profile has for doing sure. T1 adjustments. Yeah, that would be good. I, I, used to, I used to work as a tax preparer before I came into it, and I've, I've used uh, Profile since it came out in 1997. So yeah, it's one of the, it's kind of a hidden secret that we have. So what you need to do is you file the original tax return, been accepted by uh, Canada Revenue, and your client comes rolling in three days later with two more T4 slips. I know this one very well. And so what you need to do is you've got your original return, 
you click on the audit tab, you'll see snapshot in the drop down box. You click on snapshot and you give it a name, you just click on new and whatever you wish to call it. And then I go back and I've changed my name. Then now I go OK to activate the snapshot. And then I close out. And what I do, so my client came back in with another T4 slip, or it can be T5, whatever you wish. So I can, I come back here, I put in, you know, the different amounts. And I'll just go with the recommended numbers here. Just give me one more minute. Okay, so I've added an extra T4, and now I go to the form T1 ADJ. And so this is our adjustment request. What you do here now is you do a right click with your mouse, and you'll see adjust. I've got two different snapshots, so I'm going to do adjust from snapshot number two. And right away, it brings in the previous mount because on that. Uh, Original T4, I had $28,000. Then my client brought in another one of, of 10000 So you see the previous amount, the amount of change, revised amount. So automatically by doing that snapshot and then entering in the new information and coming here and just doing that right-click bingo, it's everything's done. And then you need to fill out, uh, as a rule, of description. So some people like to save the original file in a different location and then uh, do the adjustment and save it somewhere else. It's That's kind of a personal thing. I always like to uh, just keep it all together because then that helps with the carry forward amounts when you go to do the return, you know, the client's return in the next year. That way you have all the, the updated carry forward and you know, it's all, I would also go in and throw in a few memos and, on you know, why it was adjusted. Does that help, Daryl? Once again, you cannot uh, e-file in a, a T1 adjustment. You can go through the representative client service if you're registered with the representative client and do it online, but once again, that's online. That's not e-filed either. So hopefully that helps. And then do we have any other questions? No further questions via the phone line. No questions over the web. Okay, well, if there's no more questions, then I'll, I guess I'll let you get back to what you need to do at this time of year, and all the best to you for the rest of the tax season. Thank you very much. Thank you again for joining us today. This concludes today's web conference. You may now disconnect.